Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to the 70th episode of GBR, the 70th. And that's kind of hard to believe, like zero to 70 in 4.9 seconds. <laughs> but in actuality, it's really 43,632 seconds or 505 days to be exact. But who's counting? The important thing is we're here and still delivering unique and original shows every Wednesday. And today is absolutely no exception. But we do have a truly exceptional special guest on the show today, guitarist and founding member of the hugely successful Irish band, The Cranberries. Noel Hogan is with us today as we travel across the ocean to Ireland via Skype Airlines to speak with him directly. It's a long interview, and we'll get to that in just a quick moment. But first, did you know you could become a personal or business sponsor of GBR for as little as $2 a month. You probably didn't know that because, well, <laughs> we literally just launched this new program in the last day or so, but it's finally happening. Now you may be asking, what can we possibly get for $2 a month or $5 a month or whatever? And truthfully, you'd be amazed. Now we spent quite a bit of time thoughtfully developing this program to make it accessible to just about anyone who wanted it personally, or for their business. And there's a lot of options, and you can get all kinds of useful stuff in return. But even as much as I would like to say that there's something for everybody, there isn't. This is not for everyone, but if you like what we're doing, and you like to be part of it and get valuable stuff in return, I can assure you that you will be treated like royalty. And of course, if royalty is not your thing, we can certainly figure something else out. But you can find out more by clicking any one of the show sponsor links on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com. They're all over the place. And while you're thoughtfully considering all those options, we're just going to move right on to something completely different. So my special guest on GBR today is Noel Hogan. He co-founded what ultimately came to be known as the Cranberries in 1989, the band was a huge worldwide success for nearly three decades until the untimely passing of singer Dolores O'Riordan in January of 2018. Since then, the three remaining members of the group have, over the past year, worked on producing a final album from the Cranberries called, appropriately, In the End. It's a great album and was just released in March of this year. I was able to spend about an hour and a half talking with Noel a couple days ago as he goes into really great detail about the Cranberries, his career, and, well, what happens next. So let's just get to it as Noel Hogan joins us right here and right now. Hey, Noel, thanks uh, so much for coming on the show all the way from Ireland. Uh, welcome to GBR, and how are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me, Jeff. It's great to be here. Well, I, I really do appreciate it, uh, you know, taking the time. And we've spent a little time trying to get this all together. So so here we are. So let's start off the way we usually do here and, uh, you know, kind of take a look back at your youth, you know, the time before you actually started working and, and see what, you know, as you were growing up, you know, had the biggest influence or impact on getting you where you are today uh everybody's kind of got something what can you tell us um i guess for me the, the memory that sticks out when kind of things changed and my interest really started to pick up on music was around the age of 14 um i had been into music kind of before that but it was a lot of kind of what poppy kind of whatever was on the radio at the time like top 40 stuff right not so much guitar based stuff that i would have become known for later and a friend of mine at school gave me a loan of an album by The Cure and um, up until that point I wasn't really aware that there were other bands outside of the charts that kind of hovered around there and I, there was this other world of music and really I once I heard that album 
And I thought, oh, my God, this is really absolutely amazing. It just it changed everything. It made me think, OK, what else is out there that I'm not hearing? And that whole kind of journey began at that point. And it really like I, I've often kind of thought that a lot of it, my what I've done for a career and music kind of interest really began when I got that album um, at that age of around uh, 14 or 15. Um, and from that, my interest, I just became kind of obsessed with music then after that. Um, I didn't really have this big ambition to be in a band or to play music. Um, my dream was to kind of work in a record store. That's all I wanted oh, to do with that. To, to my team, reta- yeah. Retail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was like, because I, I used to spend a lot of my time kind of wandering around record stores. Um, you know, back then you would, you know, when it was vinyl and you would just flick through albums for hours on end. So that was kind of, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and, and, you know, thankfully it didn't really work out for me in that sense. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I guess from about that age until really I didn't start playing guitar, I guess, till I was about 18 then. So which is kind of late for many people would consider that very late. So, so you didn't start playing the guitar till 18, mm-hmm. is that what you're saying? No. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did, that, started going, wh- how did go, that work? Um, how did you get started with that? Yeah, I well, the other two guys in the Cranberries, Mike and Ferg, they had started playing maybe a year earlier, um, the drums and bass, and we all kind of hung out together. It was a big group of us, um, and we used to sit around watching them playing. And um, my parents, just one day out of the blue, I came home from school, and um, there was a guitar there, and they kind of said, look, we bought you this because they're doing that and you're kind of hanging around with them you're not really up to a whole lot and um, here just like learn to play and that was it that's how it came about and once I did start playing um, I kind of you know it it wasn't something I took too naturally but as the months went by I kind of got more and more into it and I couldn't work out other people's songs to do cover versions with, with the two boys so ended up kind of making up bits and pieces of my own um, which was the beginning of really the kind of songwriting side of things then it was more out of necessity than anything else so that the three of us could play together Um, and and that was really how it began and it was really almost like a kind of happy accident in many ways that that I did end up playing guitar so you know, as I understand it, and you've alluded to here, you you really got into the to the cranberries pretty much right out of the gate, and uh, so I guess you know what I'm first interested in is uh, tell me about what it took for the band to become your primary source of income because that's a big part of this. Yeah, I guess so. The band, you know, we formed the three of us were kind of playing together, and then. We had a friend of ours for about six months that lived very near us, but he, we wouldn't have hung around with him as much, but we knew him. He was in another band and he was looking to sing. He was a, a drummer in another band, but hey, he was the, the songwriter there, but wanted to do a bit of singing. Mm-hmm. So we met him and you know, I just happened to bump into him one day and we actually learned a bit from him on how to structure songs because we had no idea what we were doing. And... Um, we got along with him and everything. The, the music wasn't at all like the Cranberries. It was, a, it, they were his songs and they weren't our cup of tea. And I think we all kind of knew it. And eventually he left and we continued on. And out of that, we started to kind of form the sound of the Cranberries that, that everyone became to know. Um, but after maybe six months, I bumped into him again one day and he, he was like, oh, are you still playing and all this? And I was like, yeah. And he said, oh, I know a girl that's looking for a band. And it ended up being that he knew Dolores and he brought her up and straight away, I mean, Dolores sang a couple of songs for us and then we played some songs that we, like instrumental parts we had. Um, Linger was one of those. Sure. And um, and that was it. We kind of just clicked straight away Um and we had been together then maybe, I guess, eight or nine months. We had done demo during that time. And a lot of friends of ours said, oh, you know, that's really good. You should send that off because we did the demo for ourselves. 
It was for no other reason. And this was with but, with Dolores, right? This was with Dolores. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like we're together maybe with Dolores about eight months at this point. We mm-hmm. did the demo maybe six, seven months into it, mm-hmm. and um, we suddenly started getting this feedback. I. I made copies of the demo, I sent it to these addresses I got out of a magazine of record companies. And we started getting replies back, which we were amazed with. Um, this was coming from London. They, you know, these record companies were based there. We were in a small town in the south of Ireland that really, you know, had musically nothing had really come out of here that, that did much. So it ended up being a massive surprise for us that we got a reply. But eventually this turned into a bidding war between all these record companies wow. and we wow. got we yeah. got signed yeah it was like we had this crazy year of being flown over and back to london and playing gigs and doing the showcases um and then we eventually we signed with island records and so, so just to got, just to get a little frame of yeah. reference you you were about how old at this time Nineteen, maybe you know, about to be twenty. Okay. Kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So still, just in the early years, there, right? Yeah, yeah. Really early. What we weren't playing that long, and yeah, it was. And you weren't you know, really making any money yet to speak of, were you? No, yeah, no, yeah. no, nothing at that point. And, we and were, done, what were you doing to to stay alive? Did you um, did you have to work or anything, or did you have did, uh, low overhead or what? <laughs> I was on what we call the dole here. <laughs> right, right. I've you're heard unemployed. That. I've heard it's that. like benefit kind of thing. Right. So I right. was getting that. Dolores was finishing her last year of school and she had a kind of a weekend job. And the two boys were doing Mike was an apprentice plumber. Um and Ferg, I think, had just dabbled and kind of starting to learn how to do some hairdressing or something like that. Mm-hmm. I remember at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. So everybody was doing bits and pieces, but I mean, very low, low income stuff. Um, not really, you know, n- not much money in what any of us were doing. And in the Doris's case, none at all. So it was, we were all living at home with our parents. Um, well, so, helps. you know, you could get by. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Of course. Then suddenly we got signed and we got an advance and, and that was the first time we could actually take a wage from it. Right. You know, we, we made enough money on that to, we kind of worked out, okay, we'll take X amount a week and, and, you know, try and make this thing work. And that was the first time, I guess you consider that you would be doing this professionally in some sense. Okay. So did you have any, were you guys kind of running it yourselves? You didn't have any management help at that very early stage? We had a guy, so the studio we used to record our demos in here, and we rehearsed in the same building. That guy who owned that, he managed us at that time. Um, no, it was a very kind of loose arrangement, but he was, you know, he helped out as much as he could. But unfortunately, as it got a bit more professional and, you know, big record companies come in, he was kind of out of his depth and we could see that. So we ended up moving on from him. Mm-hmm. after that then um, and then we got what I would consider our first proper manager like professional manager in London um, maybe about a year after that then and how did that how did that work out what was uh, that person able to do for you um, well he was great if funnily enough he was one of the record companies that had approached us about signing us there's a record company called Rough Trade Mm -hmm. And it was a guy called Jeff Travis who had founded Rough Trade. Um, We were massive Smiths fans and we knew the Smiths had signed to Rough Trade and they were the first ones we sent the demos to. And we eventually met Jeff a few times from all our journeys over and back to London and meeting different record companies. And we really liked Jeff, but on the record company side of things, it just it wasn't the right fit for us at that time. Uh, we signed to Ireland, but because we liked Jeff so much, when we needed a manager, we went back and asked him, would he do it? He had never done it before, um, but something had clicked with us all and, and it just, he agreed to do it. So for the first few years, um, Jeff was our manager then, and, and we learned a lot from him as well, because we were really, really new to this business. Sure. Yeah, and you're still young. Um, yeah. You know, I like to, because I know we're, I want to kind of focus on the first 
14 years, I think it's something mm. like that, um, of the cranberries. And yeah. a lot of times we like to talk about kind of some of the milestones and, and you know, some of the challenges, um, I think as we spoke earlier, that a lot of times it's, you know, helpful for listeners to hear some of the bumps in the road, as we say, or the rough mm. spots and how uh, people deal with them. And it's kind of a good learning experience. But I'm interested kind of in some of the milestones and maybe some of the rough spots that uh, that took place during that, that first period. Uh, what can you tell me? Yeah, I guess, you know, the, the very first kind of thing, I guess, was when we say the first manager there, for instance, that I spoke about briefly, you know, when the decision was made that we had to move on from him, this was something we had never really considered having to deal with this type of stuff. And we, we spoke amongst ourselves and realized we had to go down and tell this guy. And, you know, it it was we were young and you're kind of learning, oh, God, this is the horrible side of this business where you're kind of you're essentially firing somebody yeah. um, that, that, you know, was a friend as well. But you kind of have to think, you know, you've got to put the band that, there as well. It, it's your own career you're looking at. So, you know, you have that, that that was really the first time I think we had to face the kind of the reality of what being in a band is that is going to you do this as a living. Um, and then after that, you know, the, the next one that really stood out for me was when we released the first album. We had all this hype. You know, this is after we get signed. We do the album. And. Oh, which which album? Years, no, which album the, was that? The very first album. Okay. Um, everybody else is doing it, so why can't we? Okay. And um, so we record that with with Stephen Street produced it, and um, you know we had been we couldn't put put a foot wrong up until that point because everything we did in in the UK press that they loved us, they loved us for this that, and the other. So we kind of in an arrogant kind of way just took it for granted this is the way things are you just you record music you put it out and everybody loves it but that wasn't to be the case because what ended up happening we, we'd been floating around so long and our demos had been when we released the album it it was really our demos but produced and played better and it, it didn't impress anybody mm. and the album died a death straight away oh. in the UK and Ireland. It didn't even chart and we were absolutely gutted. Um, we'd spent, you know, the bones of at this point, two and a bit years between starting out writing it and then recording it. We just thought this is going to do well and it <laughs> didn't. It did nothing. And um, it was a massive disappointment for us and a major learning curve that this business is not all you know, it isn't a bed of roses. No. And we got to the point even we were playing gigs across the UK. We were doing a tour and there was no one at the gigs. We would do well in London. We could play to a few hundred people. But outside of that, we were playing to empty rooms, you know, five people kind of thing or playing in bars where they didn't really care who was playing. It was just kind of busy because it was a bar anyway. And you do start to think this is the end of the line here. We're going to get dropped because mm -hmm. we'd heard all these horror stories over the years of bands that had been in exactly the position we were in. Um, now, the, the upside of that is we we signed to the New York office of Island Records. We kind of didn't really know the difference between, you know, the New York office and the London office. And But tipping away all the while were um, the New York office were working away on the album and particularly Dream or Linger, sorry. And Linger suddenly took off in college radio and but it the, just uh, but this was from the first album still or yeah this okay, is still right. the first that's what album. i thought that's what i thought yeah and then linger is the first single ever it's the first song we wrote right, together of course and, and the one that probably a lot of people remember yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. and um suddenly we were on this tour across europe with a, with another irish band and, and we were the opening act and we thought We'll do the tour. It's kind of, you know, it could be the last kind of run or the only chance we'll have to ever do a tour of Europe. So let's do it. And again, nobody knew who we were. Um, and it was more of a holiday for us than anything else. Mm -hmm. But about a week and a half left into the tour, um, we'd been there maybe, we'd done maybe five weeks at this point. We get a call from the States and you need to come over, lingers after taking off on wow. college radio. So we dropped what we were doing, hopped in a plane, flew from Spain to Denver and 
our first ever show was in um, Denver and we were opening up for a band called Dede and uh, we walked out that first night and the place just erupted. Everybody knew all the songs, knew who we were. It was the complete opposite of what we So you really weren't to. expecting that, it sounds like. No, no, not at all. Um, because, as I said, it had taken off in college radio and then MTV picked up on the video as yeah. well. And at the time... MTV, you know, was such a huge force that it played music all the time. And it, it just, it was a big, big thing. It, it Like, not to kind of, I know it's a cliche, but it really was a kind of game changer for us then. And suddenly we we were everywhere. And so we how, doing- did, how did your view of things change at that point? Um, you know, I mean, I can kind of imagine, but, uh, you know, after the, the Denver show and some of these things happening, mm. d- did you, you guys just, have a different attitude? Yeah, uh, about what like you, you learn to appreciate what you have a lot more because we'd been through, you know, probably a year or more of just dismal kind of gigs and just really waiting for the call that, you know, it's over for you lads, you know, we're not going to do another album. And yeah, you suddenly appreciate a lot more what it is you have and what it takes to get there and to work for it. And one, a lot of people, you know, on this side of the world and, and, you know, in the UK and Europe and that, oh, how did you break America? And honestly, we, we worked, we went there from that first trip. We stayed there and we did, we agreed to everything, no matter what we were asked to do, we did it. Mm -hmm. We played big clubs, small bars, you know, theatres, whatever it was, pool parties. We just worked and worked and worked. And we, we figured, you know what, we're lucky to be doing this. It's a hobby. It was a hobby for us. And now we can do this as a career and uh, we weren't going to mess it up. And that was it that we just, you know, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And, we never kind of let that happen again where it, you know, we, we kind of went to take things for granted and it's just going to happen. We knew it wasn't. Um, and from that moment on, everything changed for us, really. I mean, that first trip, we went to the States and we must have been there. I think it was about eight months. We just toured really? nonstop. Yeah. They just yeah. kept, and, kept uh, adding shows. And- yeah. Yeah. Because they released Dreams then, um, you know, a few months into it and, that ended up being a massive hit as well. And then the funny thing was, when we were away all that time, the album was re-released in Europe and suddenly it exploded oh, over here then. And yeah, yeah, um, yeah. we came back, I don't know, say eight months later, because we, we had left to do the European tour. We then went to America that we hadn't planned on going to Jordan. We were supposed to go to Europe and come back. That we flew back and we landed here in 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 our back the, the local airport to us is a place called Shannon mm-hmm. and we'd been doing this on and off for a few years where you'd fly out to the UK and come back and you know our parents would be there to pick us up and this kind of thing <laughs> and they were still there but there was also you know press like you wouldn't believe it was all the you know TV um, all the print radio it was just the place was just rammed and we got off the plane not expecting any of that Um because we didn't know that the album had kind of taken off oh. over here then. So they're not, they, so, you, they weren't communicating that to you exactly. No, yet. no, we had just very much focused on the, on the U S because that's, you know, that was where we were accepted and that was kind of where our focus lay at that point. And suddenly our parents were still there at the airport, but there was also, you know, the bones of whatever 50 journalists there as well. <laughs> so it was a bit weird that whole time because Suddenly, everyone who knew who we were, um, we lived at that time. Limerick was a pretty small place. And um, yeah, you really stood out all of a sudden. And every, and so like probably everybody knew who you were at that point. Yeah, because yeah, we were everywhere. We were we were being played on the radio the whole time. And we were, you know, our pictures were in the paper. And, you know, even us coming back that time was on the, the national news. If suddenly... After you too, we were now the next biggest Irish band yeah. in the world. Yeah, wow. And yeah. this is probably what an early nineties or so. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess we're looking at maybe ninety three ish. Yeah, mm-hmm. around, I guess it's around ninety three. Okay, okay. So where did it go from there? I mean, you, you, it was kind of a progression. Was it a mm. was it a straight line, or or were there? Um, you know, I guess 
we were the one small thing about the album getting re-released over here and still it was still alive and well in the US that Dolores and I had just kept writing through this whole time so we had actually written the second album during this period even mm-hmm. though a lot of people thought oh this album just came out so we wrote the album and had it recorded um, we used to record demos as we kind of travelled around and then a lot of those demos became um, the album tracks. So suddenly we had the second album done and dusted with the first album set in the charts. And it had been, you know, I guess a year and a half at this point since the first um, since the first album. So suddenly there's a new album out. And I think Dreams may have still even been in the charts at that point. And Zombie was the first single from that. And when that came out, I mean, everything changed again. Like we were at a big level with Dreams and Linger, but Zombie took it up to another level completely. Yeah, We were, you know, you couldn't, even I was sick of looking at us at that point. It was just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> everywhere you went. So, um, so after it, that yeah. album was released, did you do another tour? Did you? Yeah, get out? we kept touring. We just, we, we recorded, we toured. We took no time off, and um, did the venues just, did the venues change at all? Or, or did you see any? Was there any difference yeah, in the kinds of venues yeah, we, you were playing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we went to um, sheds in the US, you know, which were um, the kind of you know half indoor, half outdoor kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the thing was, it took off everywhere, all over the world. So suddenly, we were, you know, we were being flown to Australia. We were doing Asia back across Europe. Um, we take time out and do those things and then go straight back to the States. Even though we didn't live there, it's where we spent most of the time. Um, right, right. Because it was, it's where we broke. It was our, our biggest market. And we always kind of felt that, you know, for us, that's where we were accepted first and foremost. And it just, um, it remained that way for a long, long time. Did you get, um, so, did you get used to, Living on the road and, mm. and sort of being transient all the time. I mean, what was that like? Yeah, it just became it became the way it was because suddenly, I mean, at the age of whatever, say, nineteen twenty, we started traveling to do small tours, and then at this point now, we're you know we're probably about ninety four, um, and we'd been doing it a few years, and you just took it for granted that you you know you did an album and you lived in whatever city you did the album in. And then you just, a bus would come and pick you up and you go on the tour or you start flying. It was second nature. You never gave it a second thought. Right. Now, there were times it did start then, I guess, at the end of that second album. So we nearly toured right at this point for the bones of four, maybe tipping five years straight between doing the albums, recording them, and going on tour and it did start to kind of take its toll then on everybody I, I would imagine started I, to, I would imagine yeah that. you you were starting to miss like we the, the, our friends at home that we would have always gone out with and that we all grew up with you'd be talking to them you'd ring home and go hey what's happening and they were doing all the things that people in their early 20s normally do you know going out just having fun and going to parties and all this kind of stuff. And you're and working. <laughs> we didn't get any of that. Yeah, no, I know I can't, we should be complaining and we weren't, we knew, you know, what we had was amazing. And I mean, we were so grateful that we were doing that. But at the same time, you are starting to think I'm not getting to enjoy any other thing. Like this is all I do now. Um, but then we kind of foolishly agreed to do the next album, the third album. And and you say we foolish, off, foolishly. Yeah. Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah, because we didn't realize that we we were getting burnt out, but we didn't know. Oh, okay. And also, it's very hard to kind of keep that maintaining writing quality songs all the time because we had just written and written and then suddenly, here you are, we needed a third album from you. And we found it a bit more difficult to kind of come up with some fresh ideas on that one. I found Hmm. and we came back here and we had a couple of weeks off and suddenly we were in Dublin to do another album and 
it just wasn't the same. Nobody kind of felt like uh, they just the mood wasn't the same as it had been on the first two albums. Uh, okay, so this um, was still your third album, right? This okay. was our third album. Right. We just we went in, and um, you're kind of you know you're doing it, but you'd rather be somewhere else, oh. kind of thing. And and you were there kind of when you had to be, but not any longer. Whereas before we would go down to the studio in the morning anyway, whether you were doing something or not that day and kind of hang out and see what was going on. But a lot of the time, you know, you'd be like, ring me if you need me. I'm, I'm gone. I'm out of here. And <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> Cause you wanted to get away from it a little bit more. And so at that point we did the third album and it was released and we did about maybe a month or two of touring. There was meant to be a two year of tour again, but, um, I remember we came back to Limerick for a few days. We were meant to have a week off or something. And if anyone ever looks at videos and stuff around that time, you'll notice Dolores is incredibly thin, mm. um, really, really skinny. And it was all because she just, she couldn't take any more of it. The pressure was just getting to her. She was, you know, we didn't realize it at the time, but she says it, you know, she'd said it many years afterwards, looking back, you know, she was basically having a breakdown oh. and just, she she rang each of us that night before we were supposed to leave again to go to wherever and just said look I can't I can't do this anymore and the thing was none of us wanted to do it but none of us had the guts to kind of be the one to pull the plug in it and she rang and it was like a massive weight lifted off our shoulders um, we pulled the tour management went mental like they were just not oh, impressed the oh record company gosh. did Wow. You know, they were like, oh, you're going to lose this, that, and the other. But it had just gone to the point where we just thought, well, you know, we're going to lose our minds if we actually do it. And so, they're, they're mostly just concerned about uh, the finances, you know, the, you the know profits really. and that sort of thing. Yeah. And I, I understand yeah. that, but, uh, you yeah, know, that's, exactly. it's like, like short sighted. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, that was it. At that point, we had been at it six years up to that point mm -hmm. right now. And, that was it. We decided, look, let's just take a break, see how we feel down the road. And and that's exactly what we did. And that was but about when 90... That was 96 90, okay. going into 97. Okay. And we took maybe... It only ended up being a break for maybe, I'd say, 10 months, roughly. Okay. Um, it wasn't a long, long break, but it was enough that we all kind of felt refreshed coming back to it. So then you, you came back and... What happened and, then? Yeah. What ended up happening was, so everybody went off and, and nobody did anything to do with music for all that time. What did you do? And then I just sat around the house, <laughs> truthfully. <laughs> yeah. I remember I just kind of hung out because I I bought a house. That's what I did first because I, I was still living with my parents. And because probably, there was probably never time any to point. Move out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was never any point of buying a home because I was never here. Yeah, sure. And of course. It just, you know, it, I, I wouldn't even have time to look at a house really. And um, so we ended up, we came home. I lived with my parents for a little while. I saw a house, I bought it, I got married. And then um, during that time, just ideas started to come back about songs again. And um I started to write a little bit and, and this was like um, pre-internet. So at the time Dolores, Dolores had, be, had gotten married as well and she was living in Canada. Her husband was Canadian. Oh, okay. And um, I used to have to courier cassettes from from here to Canada. On an airplane, on an airplane, presumably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's ridiculous <laughs> when you think of it now. You know, you do it with a click of a mouse, but this, yeah. <laughs> is, this is what we had to do. And then we'd speak on the phone and say, look, we've got these ideas. And she said, oh, I've got songs I've been working on as well. And um, and that's kind of over the, the following kind of few months, I guess, we, we got some songs together and ended up going in. Then, you know, we everybody regrouped and we went in to do the fourth album then at that point. And that was, by the time we actually got in to record the album, I'd say we had been on a break for maybe a year at that point. Right. Now, just to regress a little bit, mm. um, you had the first two albums, you did the third. Um, mm. How did the third album do? 
it didn't do as well yeah. because of, you, your of heart new, wasn't quite into it, right? Our heart wasn't in it, and and definitely when you don't tour an album, yeah. it you know the album will suffer. And we got read the riot act by everybody yeah. telling us this, you I know, and can imagine kind of oh, it's all going to suffer, and it did. Um, but I mean, it's funny. Uh, I look now, right? At, everybody gets excited if if a band or an artist sells a million records. I mean, everybody loses their mind now. Whereas, you know, I think that album sold somewhere around six or seven million, but it was still seen as a failure. Um, <laughs> you know. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, it, it, different times and everything. I guess, so, I guess. But yeah, but look, um, it was, that was in many ways our own making, but we had to think long term for ourselves and and we kind of it was the best thing we ever did looking sure, back we should have taken the break after the second album after the tour it was done kind of taken a year away then and then do a third album but not knowing and and having this massive kind of success we just agreed yeah look we'll do it we'll do it let's do it we'll be fine um and then it wasn't so Going forward from that point on, from the fourth album on, we always divided things up a lot more evenly because at that point as well, we were we were all starting to get married now and, and children were starting to come into the fold. So <laughs> things changed a lot then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the fourth album, how did that do? And the, what, that what, did, and you, did really well. Did you guys go back on the road well. then at that point? We did, yeah. But what we started doing was we'd say to them, look, we're going to tour for three months and we're going to take a month off. And sure. and that's kind of what we did then. We Depending on where we were, if it was Asia, you know, you go down and you spend a bit longer and then you take a bit longer off when we got back here. And so, yeah, I mean, we did you that learned. then. You learned, yeah, right? Yeah. We learned and it worked a lot better and it, it was easier then. And um, so the, the fourth and fifth album were very much done like that then, where it was a kind of an on-off thing where you do it, then you come home and you get maybe a month or two off and mm -hmm. you could live your life. And then you look forward to going back out again. Sure. And it became a lot more enjoyable for all of us. So really kind of... Uh, you really kind of tweaked the program a little bit and you understood, yeah. you know, how to, how to yeah. make it work. And that's part of the learning process. We all kind of go through that. So things continued on and, you know, successfully, I, I, I presumed, yeah. but then in 2003, something changed Yeah, and you had to go just, do something else and whatnot. So I want to yeah. hear about that. How did, how did all that transpire? Yeah. So it got to the point that, so we'd been doing it on and off and things were going fine, but we started to feel that we were just repeating ourselves, particularly with the albums that, you know, there was, we had a sound, but at the same time you want that sound to evolve. And it was kind of, you know, painting by numbers a little bit, we felt. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody, we'd been doing it, what, I'd been almost 14 years at that point. Yeah, and wow. And <laughs> it just, you know, it was all going well. We were getting along well. Um, but I guess what began to happen, you were starting to miss your children a bit more. You started to come home and realize I've missed this section of their lives. And they were yeah. all small at that time. And then um, one of my kids got sick at the time. My eldest child, who's nearly 20 now, she was only a baby. She got very sick and it became very difficult to tour Oh, with wow. that I'm sure and, I'm, um, I know what that's like yeah, yeah you were you were away and you were you know your your mind wasn't there wasn't on it like all the time and you felt that I'm not really doing this justice and I'm not doing my family justice and and we all kind of felt in different ways with different things that you know I think it's run its course for now um, and then we were out rehearsing one day and kind of got talking about it. And uh, again, it was one of those things where would I bring it up or will he bring it up or she? And we we could tell, I think, from speaking to each other that maybe it was time to take a break from it. And and that's exactly how how it began was a conversation. And then that conversation grew more and more. And we were reluctant to agree to a tour. And we just decided, look, let's let's just like not break up, but just take a break, but a long break away from it. And when we all feel like we want to do it again, you know, we'll ring each other because thankfully we all parted on good terms. And even during that time, we would be in touch with each other. 
um, you know, you'd be kind of not constantly, but every now and again, you would ring each other up or start to email each other and see what was going on. And if one of us released something, you know, the others would kind of send you messages about it. And I, me personally, I started to kind of, my interest musically was kind of go a slightly different direction. And what was and that? I I had started to listen to, um, at the time, uh, stuff like that Radiohead was doing. And then I was listening to kind of more, like I'd listen, started listening to Beck and stuff that had a lot more kind of electronic type of stuff, a mix mm-hmm. of guitar with electronic stuff. And I, I became interested in that and started working with a guy in London to, and basically learned how to program. Um, bought myself a laptop, had started going down that road. And I... A lot of these song ideas that I did lying around, I changed them around um, to become these kind of songs that had a lot of electronic in them. And then I started working with different vocalists that I'd met through my travels or through friends um, and a lot of experimenting going on. And in 2006, it took me maybe two years to do this album because I do a bit and then I take time off and then I come back and I tweak it here and mm-hmm. I built a small studio at the house because I learned that with a laptop there was a lot I could do that I didn't need a big studio. Yeah, um, it was all changing. Two, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was all changing, you know, um, and it was a huge learning curve, but it made it so enjoyable to play music again. Um, that was miles away from the Cranberries, but it just... I, you know, I look forward to it every day, going in to do it. And I released an album then in 2006. That, I that think was a it solo? Was. was that a solo album? It was. It was an album. Yeah, it was like I basically played everything on it. But okay. then I had different vocalists um, doing top line on it. What was, and, the, um, what was it called? It was called Mono Band. Oh, that's right. And, sure, I knew that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was kind of... Um, a passion project more than anything else. But, you know, I'm still very proud of that album. Um, it was received, you know, amazingly. Um, and it was an album that I knew recording. I could never tour it because I had gone too far. Oh, with the sure. songs, you of know, course, yeah. it, it was like <laughs> these songs. Yeah. Yeah. To play. yeah. Now I did a few shows but it, I needed an army of people to do it because <laughs> a big there band. was so much a going big band on. Yeah, a big band and a load of vocalists and all this, you know. So it's, it was fun. It was really fun. And I really enjoyed that whole time. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of think I needed to get that out of my system. Sure. Um, and, and I did and I enjoyed it. And the good thing about it was I met tons of people. I worked with loads of people. And I also, it led to kind of other projects during that time off as well, because people kind of, especially here in Ireland, a band would have heard it and go, would you ever think about producing? And I did, you know, a bit of that as well then for smaller bands and like a lot of it, nothing ever became of, you know, they released the albums, but, but it was a lot of fun and a lot of learning. And by the time I went back to the Cranberries in 2009, I had, you know, six years of doing that and sure. a lot more experience when I went back into it then. Well, tell us you about could bring tell, that with you. Yeah. So tell us about the about that sort of reuniting. And I can imagine that, uh, you know, everybody had something different uh, to bring back. And how was it different? Well, first of all, how did it how did it come about? And then how was it different? It started. Um, it was probably about 2008 that. um Dolores's eldest boy, Taylor, um, they were still living in Canada at this point and uh, Dolores would have been quite religious um, and she wanted Taylor to make his confirmation. Um, so she came back here and organised it through one of the schools. It, it happens when you're, I guess you're about 12 or 13, you make it here. Mm-hmm. And um, she invited us all, the, the four of us and our wives and our kids to come along and it was very much her family, you know, her mom and, and all that and all her brothers. And we went and that's the first time the four of us had been in a room together since 2003. Wow. Um, yeah. So it was kind of weird, you know, it was kind of, it was exciting and it was great. Like we had spoken on and off and, you know, kind of kept in touch, as I said, but we'd never been in the room together, the four of us. And um, 
yeah, we just, we met there and we were started, you know, going, going over stories of all the years and all the kind of through the nineties and all the, and the fun that we had. And I guess from that meeting, there was, you know, we kept started to get more in touch and then thought maybe we should do a tour, see, see if anybody remembers us or anybody wants to to hear us still. There was no talks of recording anything at that time. Right. It was well, just... you had a lot of material, that's for sure, yeah, to go out on yeah, tour. Exactly. And, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, we made, inc- you know, we, we rang up the agents and, you know, kind of this type of thing. And, yeah, they were like, yeah, we'd love to have you. And, and so they put a tour on sale for the States um, to see how it would go. And, and there were small venues now originally. But, um the tour sold out in minutes really? and suddenly they were like, Oh, we can move you up to bigger places. So we were like, yeah, whatever. Like, and, and then that sold out and wow. suddenly we were in, it was like 2009 and, uh, we all met in Boston and spent three weeks there, um, rehearsing. And that was it. Like we hadn't played together since 2003. So how did that go? Was, what, what was it like? How did it progress? It was, <laughs> it was bizarre in that, Okay, the first hour is a bit, um, you know, myself and the two boys would always meet first to get the three of us going to, you know, dust off the cobwebs a little bit. But it just, I mean, after an hour, it was like we'd never taken any time yeah, off. Yeah, that's nice. You just, you'd call out a song and go, yeah, okay. And even going into the song, you'd be like, how's that go? But suddenly when you heard the others playing, you remember? Yeah. It, like, it, it may not have been the tightest band in the world, but we were surprised at how well it sounded after all that time. And then after a couple of days of that, you know, the doors was nearby in the hotel and we were like, come on over, I think we're we're ready. And once she sang on top of it, that was it. It just it clicked now, straight away. Did you were you playing anything differently at that point? Did you uh, were you tweaking any of the songs? Was there any maturity that happened or pretty much, you know, replicating what you had done? I think we were playing better because um everybody had kind of played in different things during that time mm-hmm. and we made we did start to like the, the bones of the songs were the same because there were some songs we couldn't mess with like the likes of Linger and Dreams sure. and Zombie and things mm-hmm. like that you know if you started to kind of mess around with those people would get pretty annoyed I think so <laughs> so, so we ended Funny up you know, a lot of those yeah, yeah <laughs> it is and um, so we but we did things that make make intros longer or outros longer so that the doors could get a bit of a break and things like that. And then we started to, we brought in like another guitar player to kind of, because when I record, I layer and layer guitars on top of each other that it's more or less impossible for one guy to do on his own live. Yeah, Um, I can imagine. So we brought in another guy, you know, a friend of ours to play guitar. And then that was another element we brought in, you know, and, and then, um, we got a keyboard player to come in because the door said, you know, if she could run around the stage more, if she didn't have to play keys all the time. So there were little things like that then starting to happen. And um, it just, it filled up the sound and it just, yeah, it was just a lot of fun to do. And, and then suddenly we were, you know, our first gig, I think was in Detroit, I think, or something like that, um, that year. And we were all really, really nervous that first night, as if it was kind of the first gig again. <laughs> um, yeah, it was weird. And uh, yeah, it just, it, it went amazingly. It was just, it was great fun and we all enjoyed it. What was the audience like? How did they respond? It was amazing. I mean, they just went crazy. And it's funny, I guess a lot of them were, you know, similar age to us. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of kids that would have been in college when when we started out and they would have come to see us probably at their college. And then we're suddenly, um, we're here, you know, all of us, another, whatever, the bones of 20 years later, maybe. And yeah, um, yeah everybody just enjoying it and, and still the audience going crazy. And it just kind of, for us, it was amazing to see that after all those years away that we hadn't been forgotten. Because you kind of think, yeah, maybe you will, because it does happen. But no, it was it was just amazing to see that it was still stuck and people still remembered every word. Yeah. Um, so how did that progress from the standpoint of uh, did you, you got back into the studio and you started to record yeah, at some point we, again? Or 
Yeah, what ended up happening then? So we that tour became a world tour then. Would be kind of okay. without noticing. Just, just grew and grew and grew. Yeah, yeah. It was like that was great. What's next? And then it was like suddenly you're in Brazil and then you're in Japan and you're you know, so it was amazing. Um but again we went back to the formula of doing, you know, X amount of say do two months and then come home. Mm. And then take a month off. Smart, very we're still smart. stuck yeah. to that formula, yeah, and that worked for us perfectly. So then um, we get to 2012. But rewinding back a little, I guess what ended up happening was eventually playing all the time. You start to write more again. You know, you're stuck in hotel rooms and with not much to do. And the difference was, I knew how to use a laptop this time. Yeah, you got to, internet now, and everything, yeah, everything's yeah, different. <laughs> exactly. So, Dolores and I began that process, but it became a lot more kind of when you gave the demos now, they were a lot fuller, a bigger picture kind of here's what I think this is the direction this should go in. Mm-hmm. And it worked really well. So we rang up, uh, we rang up our old producer, Stephen Street, who had done a lot of our stuff, um, asked him would he be interested in doing their album. So in 2012, early tw- 2012, we went in in uh, Toronto, we went and did, I think it was maybe five or six weeks and recorded uh, the Roses album, which was the first album we had done in, I guess, seven or eight, eight, eight or nine years, I'd say. Yeah. And um, it was amazing. You know, it was and to, to do, to go in with stuff that you had kind of written on a laptop and recorded and be able to still use a lot of that stuff was amazing because I, I would always assume that, these are just kind of demos and we'll, we'll change it around. And, um, but yeah, we were able to use a lot of that. And then you were bringing a lot of the elements that you had learned from when during the years away that we were able to introduce to the cranberry stuff then. And, um, yeah, that album just, it was fun to do and it kind of fell, it fell into place very quickly. And, um, yeah, it came out and, Everybody was surprised because it was a slightly different sounding album. Was it? Okay. Um, it was a more mature album. I would think. I guess for us. Yeah. 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 Like it's inevitable that this will happen. How did it and, do? Uh, How did it do? It did really well. You know, um, it's still to this day. It's funny how it did really, really well in Europe. Um, now, it did well in the States, but not as well as the other albums. But it's one of the albums that we're most proud of for some reason. Mm-hmm. I guess it's because... It's for us, it was a different sounding album to the ones that we'd gotten used to being able to do. And for us, it kind of holds a special place then. And um, yeah, we just, you know, we toured it and then decided we did at that point, say from 2009 to 2013, and then decided that we would take a bit of a break again then from it. Because we were very conscious that we didn't want to go down that road we'd gone down yeah, you got years smarter. earlier. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and we realized as well, and this wasn't really in a kind of arrogant way, but we could take time away and come back to it and people would still come and see us. I would think so, it was, sure. Because yeah, yeah, you're established. Um, you're established. you got that fans. Was it, you you know? People follow the yeah. music. They love it. And yeah, they're and ready was, anytime. <laughs> We didn't realize that until, you know, we had come back and kind of seen that, OK, there, there is a fan base there that will. And um, so you were able to go away and we all just went off and lived our lives again and did different things. Um, like a lot of your life as you get older, you know, and, and your kids are there um, and we all have a lot of kids. each of us, So it ends up taking up a lot of your time. But it was always great to know that the Cranberries was there to go back to then. Right. And. Um, and that's kind of what what we would do. We would come and go and we would do the odd thing. You know, we would do a festival. Maybe we would get offered a festival and we would show up and do that. And then, you know, do maybe a couple of those and then go back home for another while again. And, um, and then um, I guess in 2015, maybe, I think it was around then, Doris and I, Doris was asked to do a TV show called The Bachelorette, in the the US version of that. Right. And, and which was a bizarre <laughs> request, I have to Sounds say. Sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, her brother rang me because her brother kind of managed Dolores for a long, long time. And uh, 
she was in the States and um, he said, look, she's been offered this and she was curious to know what I could do it with her as an acoustic and they want to do linger. And I was like, OK, it's a weird one, I said, <laughs> but look, you know, <laughs> it's a, you know, you get you, you get the usual sales pitch of it's got X amount of million people watching it and it's good exposure and you're going, oh, all right, look, we'll do it then. So I said, we should bring strings along with us to, to fill it up. There you go. So that's what we did. We went up, we did Linger, and there was a guy I've been working with on and off for a few years on other projects that I asked him would he get a quartet together. Um, he plays with the Irish Chamber Orchestra. And they showed up and we kind of, we rehearsed it more or less on the spot. And then they rolled the cameras and, and we did it. Uh, it was something like the Bachelorette had come to Ireland and um, they had this place called Christ Church in Dublin, which is this huge, huge um, church. It's, I don't know how many hundred years old. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But it sounded unbelievable inside, inside there. And um, so we rehearsed it and we, we basically played it live. We did it twice uh, for them. But it started a conversation with Dolores and myself about what would it be like to do a full album like this. And we both went home and were thinking about it and then started talking over the following few days about maybe for the fun of it, we would record an album with us and a quartet of all the kind of hits and completely rework them. Sort of an unplugged and, kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that was kind of what we were thinking. So, you know, we basically over the following few months started to work on that idea. I got in touch with that same guy, Ken, and kind of went through it with him. And, and we, the Irish Chamber Orchestra are based here where we live, just coincidentally. So we, we rented their room for a month and we went in and started to work on this. And we ended up with an album of acoustic kind of tracks with the four of us playing on it. Um, we paired it well back down and you have the likes of Zombie and Dreams and all that, but acoustically with string section. And it just worked for some bizarre reason. Like, I guess a lot of these songs were written on acoustic to begin with. Yeah. So to pair them back, it was really a kind of a test of the songs to see how well they would stand up now. And the combination of that and making you realize actually how good these songs were again, because you can take them for granted. You write them, you play them, and then you just do them every night and you kind of, you have to switch off sometimes because you've been playing them for 20 odd years and suddenly it gave them a new lease of life. And we really enjoyed having to strip them back and, and take a heavy song like Zombie and play that acoustically and still make it sound good. It's a challenge um, that we, you know, we, we really, really enjoyed. Sort of deconstructing it in a lot of ways. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, my, my watch is <laughs> talking to me there. The watch Apologies. is talking to you. That's yeah, how far we've yeah. come, isn't it? The yeah, watch yeah, is talking to you. <laughs> sending a courier with a cassette to Canada. I, I'm going to leave that so, in. I, I, that's just too funny. So I'm, I'm not going to yeah. edit that out. But, but, okay. but um, yeah, so, so the, how did that album was released and what happened? Yeah, and um, we decided we would tour that album then as well. As like an that. doing a acoustic, As an acoustic show acoustic with with a quartet. Wow! And yeah, I mean, the album came out and it just the reception it got was unbelievable. Like we didn't think anybody would take much notice of it, but the critics, everybody just loved it. Just loved the whole idea of it and the way it was executed. And um, yeah, we we kind of said to the agent, you know, do you think we could tour it? But you know, we, we knew we couldn't do it in big venues. It just wouldn't work. We would be lost in a big place. So what they ended up doing was um, they got all these like kind of really old kind of theatres across Europe um, mm -hmm. that would have been designed for that kind of music. And that's what we did the tour of. And um, it just sounded amazing in these really old rooms. And what we would do is do maybe... Say, say in Paris, we did three nights in the one place because that way then you were still getting to enough people. Yeah, that's right. You know, and, and it worked. 
and uh, yeah, I mean, it was great. I mean, it was really good and it worked really well. And um, now the only problem with that tour was the summer before this, we had we'd been doing this album. We recorded the album and we'd been offered a few festivals. And during that summer um, of festivals, Dolores pulled her back out. Hmm. She was literally picking up guitar and kind of pulled her spine. And um, this has become a bit of an ongoing problem oh, for her then it just yeah, yeah and i know what that's like to, i have a back yeah to go out from time to time so that's it you know <laughs> and good. she kind of she couldn't even play guitar because holding the guitar you know it was too heavy and um so we were meant to do a, a full kind of i think it was about a year long tour with that album but um her back became worse and worse and i guess we were maybe three months two months even i'd say into the uh, about a month into it, she started saying to me, my back's not right again. You know, just something weird going on. Cause she thought it had been, it had been better for a while. But then when you start playing live, singing every night, running around the stage, it just becomes, you know, a bit more of a chore. Um, and then eventually she ended up collapsing after the last two gig we did was oh. in London in a place called the Palladium. And she left, the next gig was meant to be, I think it was in Birmingham. And um, she got to Birmingham and it got so bad, she collapsed and ended up in the hospital. So she was seen by a few doctors, specialists, and they said, look, you can't continue on with this. You're going to have to take six months off. Oh, You can't. So that was the end of the tour. Mm. Um, That would have been the end of, it was like the last week of May, I think of 2017 okay. that was okay um so that was kind of the end of that really and everybody went their separate ways and we were really really disappointed and then the doors more than anybody that she couldn't finish that tour because it had been going so well it had been like the, re- the reviews of the tour were absolutely amazing that we were able to pull this off live and uh doors went back to new york she's been living in new york now at this point for a few years and this is in, and this is now in this two, is 20, 2017. 17, yeah. And yeah. what happened then? Because, you know, obviously we yeah. know what ultimately yeah. happened, but I but how did that how did that lead up? Because I want to talk well, about Dolores, but I know that's a tough yeah. tough thing to talk about. But tell me how things went from there. Yeah, well, what happened there was so so when we did the acoustic album and then we're out touring it, eventually as the two of us would always end up doing maybe we should start writing another album. That conversation would always end up happening if we spent long enough together. And the doors was kind of had been through a lot um, in those years, kind of the tr- previous three years. She had been diagnosed with bipolar. She had gotten that under control, but she'd also divorced her husband. Mm. And that's how she ended up living in New York. So she kind of kept saying, look, I have a ton of stuff going on in my life. I think I could write some serious you know, seriously good songs at this point. So tour finishes. I went to France because my family were meant to go there that summer whilst I toured and I would fly in and out. They were going on holidays in the south of France. So um, what ended up happening was the tour got cancelled. They were sent to New York and I went down to the south of France waiting for my family to arrive. And the tourist rang me a few days into it and said, look, I know we got to take the six month break and all this, but how would you feel about we write the album whilst we're taking the time off? Because I can do that. I don't have to be on tour for that. I thought that was a great idea. And I knew she was in that headspace of doing it because we'd spoken so much about it in those few, like those couple of months we were on tour. So that's how it began. I got my tech to send down a few bits to me to France and I had three weeks on my own before my family were going to arrive. So I started writing and I'd send the stuff to Dolores in New York. And she was writing her parts over that. And also she was writing her own stuff independently for this album. Because that's the way we wrote. They'd be the co-writes and then they'd be Dolores' the songs on her own. So between June and December of 2017, we basically worked on and off for the than what became the last Cranberries album. So you were, um, were you putting it, did you have tracks or did you have demos or yeah, anything put together? Demos. It was like demos that would have been done, you know, on a laptop and then I'd send them over and then she'd do a vocal 
over in New York and she'd send back the idea and go, look, I'm thinking of this and I'm thinking of that. So all these songs started to accumulate. Um, the guy she lived with, her partner at the time, he was pretty good at recording. He he was in the music business as well. So he was able to record everything she was doing. You know, she'd kind of, she'd be a big one for waking up in the middle of the night with, oh yeah, I, I have a bit for that song now. And she'd put it down. And she would send me bits over and back, but not everything because it, we would do a bit of a song move on to the next one, come back to one before it, you know, there was all, so between her hard drive and my hard drive, there's a lot of stuff there and we've well lost track by Christmas of what we have. Yeah. But we, the but plan was that January came round and she was, she was back here in Ireland and um, she said, look, we'll, we were meant to go to China to start a tour up again in China. We were meant to do about a month there. And then after that, come back and then start recording the album. Um, so that's how we we left it. And um, we were like, look, we better get in soon and kind of look through what it is we have, because there's a lot of stuff here. We don't know how many songs we have, what's good, what's not. Um, we knew we had the bones of an album, but not really, you know, where it stood. So um, that was up to the Christmas of 2018 then. Yeah. Um, and then obviously... Come January, the doors passed away then. That was in 2018, right? That was 2018, yeah. And so yeah. Um, that must have been a, a terrible shock. And mm. uh, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, you have an awful lot of feelings about that. It's been some time has passed. And uh, yeah. so I wanted you to give you a little bit of an opportunity to, to talk about it to the degree that you want to. Mm. Um, it must have taken some time. And then at some point you know, you got um, back into working on this other album. So how did that go? And um, what was the experience like at that point? Yeah. So um, obviously, you know, there was the, I get the call and I mean, like anybody who's lost anyone, you know, it's just an absolute, it's like to say it's a blow is an understatement. It was just because I'd spoken to her only the day before. Um, so that's, I guess, to this day is the thing I always remember the most is how you can be talking to someone that were basically Doris and I the same age. You know, if somebody is, is sick or very, very old or, you know, you kind of, and you get that call, maybe you're kind of expecting that call, but to just get it out of the blue um, for someone that's not really old or is in perfectly good spirits um, the day before, it, it took a while to get, to get over the shock of it really yeah, I would imagine um, I would imagine yeah yeah and even now you know you kind of still go how the hell did that all happen you know kind of how you dealt with that but look as you said time has passed by and, and you do reflect on it and you kind of you look at it now in with different eyes I guess than you do which say like you you become more used to the idea that that person isn't around more so than they kind of get over it really um but it, that that month, you know, it was, you know, we had the funeral later in the month and then there was a few weeks go by and you're kind of sitting around here a lot. And I personally just kind of stayed in the house the whole time. I didn't really leave because it was, you know, you lose somebody and you get time to kind of mourn that person. But when it's very public like that, um, when I found a couple of times I did go out People mean well and they're kind of, you know, I'm sorry to hear the news and everything, but you don't know what to say to people. You don't know how to act around people. It's just awkward. And I found that staying here was the easiest thing to do. And I had my own way of getting over it. And eventually one of those ways was to start listening to what it was we had worked on from the year before. Because at that point, you know, nobody had heard it, only Doris and myself and I just started, I hooked everything up here and I started going through the hard drive and realized that we had a, not just a normal kind of Cranberries album, but a really, really strong Cranberries album. And it just, um, it, of course, it all takes on a different meaning as well when you're listening to it at this point. And I guess this is the end of February of 2018. And um, so I kind of, got the demos in the best shape I could and I sent them to the two boys and they loved what they were hearing and then I spoke to Dolores' family well the three of us spoke to Dolores' family 
to tell them, you know, look, we're thinking of finishing this album. And they were delighted that we were going to do it because the doors had been, it was the biggest thing happening in her life at that time was this album. She was so happy with the way it was going. And she kept going on about, let's go in and record. Because it was one time she wanted to go in and recording. And I was like, but we're not even ready. The boys haven't even heard the songs yet. You know, we need to kind of slow down till we get in. Um, and that's that was it. They knew how excited she was because when she was back here in Ireland, she would, you know, stay out with her mom and stuff like that. So it it just kind of started to take shape. And then the drive that she had in New York was brought over here to Ireland. And I was able to take bits that I didn't even know she had recorded oh, okay. from that. So you had everything. Put them on. You had everything. So I had point. everything. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got everything together and kind of you had X amount of songs that were fully finished. There were, there are songs on those drives that there's bits and pieces. They're not finished. They never will be obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just kind of went, look, not forget about those. They'll never be used because she wouldn't want that. Yeah. And we ended up with these 11 tracks that are on this album. And then um, we, you know, we contacted Stephen Street again and we sent him what we had. And it was Stephen then who said, look, I think this is amazing, but I think you should do it now, not leave a year go by or any time go by, because I don't think you're going to feel the same about it. And I think he was right because it, it helped us get over the whole thing. It's very hard to imagine that whole time now without recording that album. Yeah. It was something to focus on. It was something you knew she wanted to finish. Um, so it just made the whole thing feel right. Yeah. So how long did it take? And uh, I mean, the, the album has been released for, what, a month or more uh, yeah. uh, now. But but how did how, how long did it actually take all the way it into took, March of this year? Yeah, like I guess so we went in, um, I think it was April, gone into May of that year. Mm -hmm. And then we were about a month in there. So we had the Doris' vocals and then we had had the demos and, and, you know, we kind of paired back the demos, took out the usual bits we would take out, kept the bits we needed. And um, we worked around those and, you know, it, it just became, it became a natural thing initially. Like it was very weird the first couple of days realizing what it is you were doing here that you know the doors wasn't there and we were very used to the doors coming in, in the evenings and kind of doing our vocal parts that's the way we would operate three of us would work through the day she'd come in about five or six and do vocals then to maybe 10 at night with Stephen. she liked to sing at night not so much during the day and um you know at that time would come every evening and, and she wasn't showing up and you did get more used to it as, as the days went by but um yeah, it was. It was weird, but you start to realize that I kind of need to get it together here to kind of to do this album justice. You need to focus on what you're here to do. And I think we all went through that and it just became the kind of the way it was then. And I think the album is probably, I, I think the three of us agreed that it's one of, if not the best Cranberries album we did because of that. You focus, you still try and do your best on it for the song for the album and um, it's, a, it's a really, really strong album. But funnily enough, sounds more like the first two albums than oh. any albums we've done since. Well, then it, that, that should do well. And it's called In The End, in, right? In The End, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and how did you come up with that name? I mean, it's, it's not, one of the, yeah. yeah, it's I mean, one I think of the I get it, but I mean, there. it's just. Yeah, because it was like, we, we went in, kind of hadn't given any of that stuff. You know, we didn't think about the artwork and we didn't think about the uh, title. We just kind of said, let's do the album. And um, we went in and suddenly that's one of the tracks that's that's on there. Yeah. That it was the last track we recorded. It was just the way it worked wow. out. <laughs> um, it's about things ending, that song is, and about how really the grass is always greener. You think... You know, it's going to be better over there, but in the end, it isn't, you know. Um, and the lyric of the song and the feeling of the song just seemed to sum up everything. So we kind of, we did it and we were in the room together, the three of us, and suddenly realized as well that this is the last time the three of us will be in the one recording studio together as the Cranberries recording a Cranberries album. So 
it just felt they, they, an hour later we were sitting down listening to the takes and you're going, we should call the album after this. And, and that's what we did. Yeah. Well, it's, it's probably the best thing you, you could have called it. Mm. Um, so the album has been out. What, what has been the initial uh, reaction? Yeah, to it? it's been, I mean, you go through a year with the bones of a year. We have it done. No, we record it. Like we hadn't finished it. We'd bits and pieces over the year you were coming and going back to, but you wonder, oh God, how's this going to be received? Is anyone, you know, have we done the right thing? You start to double guess yourself a lot. And I guess the first tester was when the single came out back at the 15th of January, which was a year to the day that the Doris had passed away. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we did it and then, you know, you get the guts up to go online and start to look and suddenly it's just nothing but positive reviews and mainly from fans. That's what you go by first and everybody just over the moon about it. And then we took that as a good sign for the album. Um, but then when the album came out and we saw the reaction, I mean, we couldn't, if we'd have hoped for reaction, this was a million times better, you know, than what we had ever hoped for. It just, it was unbelievable um, how people got what it is we were doing, um, how, they, how much they loved it. I mean, it's just been phenomenal. We've been really, really blown away by the reaction of it. We never expected it to be as positive as it has become. Well, and that's that's got to be uh, really, really helpful to to everybody involved for a lot of different yeah. reasons. Um, I, I want to talk uh, with what time we have left about a couple of other things. I want to talk mm. about a little bit about the future, but you know, we all because we're a, a business focused show. I always like to to talk to players a little bit about, uh, you know, the business side of what they do and some of the mm. things that um, they're involved with, you know, in addition yeah. to their, to their uh, recording and playing and stuff like that. And a lot of, uh, a lot of players obviously have endorsement deals and other kinds mm. of uh, marketing things uh, going on. And it seems to me that that you've kind of gotten into that uh, somewhat uh, with um, a few people or at least one yeah. in individually. Um, so I kind of want for our, our listeners, tell us a little bit about what you're doing on that front right now. And and, uh, you know, we'll we'll take a look at that. Yeah. Well, I guess um, what I've ended up doing over the years, because I found for me, for writing, um, I built a small studio over my garage here. It's nothing fancy, but it does, you know, it does what I needed to do. And um, as you kind of go through the years, you, you go through a lot of different ways and means of recording until you find your way of doing it. As a guy said to me years ago, there's no right or wrong way to do this. You just, you do it your way. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what works for you. And, and it was the best piece of advice I think I ever got because you can read magazines all day and they'll all tell you, oh, you need to do it this way. This is how it should be done. And you might be thinking, hmm, maybe, well, I don't do it that way, but you know, you're better off sticking to what works for you. Um, like there's a company called UAD that I've been working with for a long time now. I mean, back since about 2012. Um, what does UAD my, stands for? Um, Universal Audio is what, oh, okay, you know, they'd be sure, more yeah, known. Okay, yeah. all right. That one we yeah. all know. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And um, for them, I mean, I met some of those guys when we were on that tour for um, the Roses tour. And I, you know, I had done the demos for the Roses album at that time. But I hadn't, um, we hadn't recorded the, recorded the album yet. Um, and they were like, oh, if you're interested, you know, we'd love to be involved with you. And so I started using their plugins at that time. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the years that have passed, I've gone on to use their hardware as well. And I mean, they've been brilliant with me. They just like, I'd, I'd hear or, or meet someone I know that is using some of their equipment. And then I call them up and they've always been amazing to kind of supply what it is I need and like particularly the Roses album, the acoustic album, um, in the end, all the demos for all those albums were all done using a uh, UAD equipment. Wow. And, uh, it's really, you know, in many ways it's an industry standard and even funnily some friends of mine that would be really kind of 
known for producing and mastering and, um, you know, mixing like a lot of kind of really well known stuff. I'd say to them, oh, I'm using that. And then they live up contacting them as well. And, and other relationships have built up because of that. So for me, I couldn't recommend them enough. So is that, um, are there any formal things that you do in that sort of position? Do you have a, a relationship that, um, that they are able to use uh, in, you know, uh, in terms of like an endorsement deal or a, yeah, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that. And I mean, every now and again, um, you know, those guys will they'll send me demos of um, like plugins or something like that. And just to get your opinion on it. And then, you know, you might write a short piece for them or mm-hmm. you might kind of, you know, take a photo of you using it. Just, right. you know, things like that. Um, but I mean, genuinely, as most people in my position, you if it doesn't sound good, you're not going to use it. Of course. I mean, no matter who's. So it's because genuine. I, yeah. yeah, because look, I have honestly been given demos of things over the years that just weren't really for me, you know, and, and you just, you can't really put your name to it then if you don't believe in it. Because um, you're not going to use it. There's no point you having it and getting other people to, you know, here, you use this as well then. And, and, and if you don't kind of use the thing or feel the same about it, so, um, I mean, and it's funny, no matter what studios have been all over the planet, um, you see the universal audio equipment in them. So, so it's, it's not, you know, it's not just me. It's yeah, <laughs> they're, they're a kind of industry yeah. standard, really. Yeah. I mean, is it, so would, would you say it's been a mutually beneficial uh, relationship? I, I hope so. Yeah. You know, and it's funny, like I could, I could be in the studio here like at night working and I'll take a photo of the studio and put it on Instagram and you'll see the UAD gear in oh, the studio. They like and that, it's funny eh? how, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's mad how a lot of people like that would follow me, then would go, Oh, I have that. I've used that as well. And, you know, and everybody's in agreement. Yeah. It's, you know, it's all, this is, you know, it's, it's uh, the great thing as well. I recently, I went to Nashville about three weeks ago and I brought that stuff with me and I went into a studio there and they already had it all there hooked up anyway, the same stuff. So all it meant was I just had to plug into the side of my laptop and everything worked without having to pull out anything. Nice. So, I mean, it can't be more convenient than that. So moving from that, I mean, I think that's mm. always, you know, uh, really informative and helpful for mm. people who are working toward that sort of thing. And of course, with somebody with the kind of stature that you have, it it's really meaningful um, on both sides. But now we're kind of... You know, look, you're still a young guy from my yeah. perspective. I, I mean, you must be because I consider myself, you know, middle aged and I'm a bit older than you. But okay. uh, <laughs> but but but, uh, you know, as you look on the horizon, um, what's important to you now? Uh, what you know, what kind of aspirations do you have? What are you going to be doing with the, the album and stuff going forward? What does it look like? Have you thought about it at all? Yeah, like it's been weird how time kind of your I started like whenever a year and a half ago um, with Dolores passing away and getting over all that. And then a lot of last year kind of finishing this album with the thought that that's it. You know, this is the end of this now once we're done here. And then back in January when the single came out, we started going around the place, kind of doing press. We've done a lot of press for the past six months and it's been amazing and it's been great to meet tons of fans and stuff. And like one thing that never entered our head was to do anything live with this because, you know, without the doors, you think, how is this possible? It, it, you know, you don't give it a consideration. And a couple of times it was brought up a year ago, you kind of just immediately dismissed it. Um, But then... As time has gone by, people have mentioned it to us, you know, would you do a one off of just this album even? And that's something, I guess, that we would have been really against before. But as we've been having this discussion over the past few weeks, it's we wonder, is there a way to do this album live one time or twice or something like that? Is there? You know, we're looking at options. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, I'm not saying there is, but I'm not saying there isn't, yeah. whereas I would have before. You know, maybe it's it's a case of bringing different guest vocalists on to do different songs. Sure, that's one way to do maybe, it. Maybe, yeah, you know, maybe, you know, we, we just ask somebody to, but we tell everybody that it is just a one-off. You know, it's we're not ever trying to replace the doors. Um, well, you could you know, do a, you could do a, a, a terrific live performance with a bunch of people and yeah, you know record it you know, and uh, do it yeah. do a video thing out of it and you can make a big deal out of it and that would be yeah. kind of all things for all people. But it you know it's that's the thing because like we for us to not do an album live this is the first time we've ever done it mm-hmm. uh, you know without ever doing one gig for an album right. um, and. It's funny how when the three of us were together talking, we'd be in a van or whatever, we'd be talking about whatever song, and you go, I wonder what it'd be like live, and we'd be all giving our theory about how you would translate that song yeah. to a live, because it always, it takes on a life of its own when you start to do it live. It, it It's sure very does, yeah. tamed, clinical kind of way of doing it in the studio. You know, you do the drums, you do the bass, then you do the guitar and so on, whereas live, everybody's there at once, and it just, you know, you let loose. So there's that curiosity there. Um, so I, what we've kind of said to most people is, look, we're going to take the summer out, kind of July and August, and the three of us are going to go off and just relax for a while and and have a think about what it is, if anything, that we do next mm. in relation to this album and yeah. the Cranberries. Um, you know, it's it's something that interests us, but it's obviously a massive undertaking. And not everybody's going to want us to do it as well. And we realize that, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of hardcore fans would might think oh, you shouldn't do that. And then other fans, as we've discovered, were then like, you should do it. Oh, well, you're never so, going to please everybody. We know that. No, right, no. You know, discovered so. that a long, long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's probably you know, best so, to take some time off and, and just Yeah, exactly. I think that's it, what you know? we need to do was to get some separation from it. Because yeah. um, that's one of the reasons I went to Nashville a few weeks ago was to to do some songwriting with other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, completely unrelated to Cranberry stuff, you know. And mm-hmm. it was good to get away for a couple of weeks and do that and just forget about the cranberries and it was great fun yeah. and again you're meeting new people and um so you have a whole you have a whole career ahead of you still and are you thinking about that at all is that starting to kind of come yeah, into like the, the, the thinking writing a little bit side of it is definitely something that interests me mm-hmm. um i i kind of asked my publisher did he think there would be interest in it and Suddenly he came back with all this stuff. Yeah, you know, is this enough for you? So I was like, okay. Um, so there is that option. And I think no matter what happens, that's something I really would like to continue doing mm-hmm. because I've done it since really I began in this band. And I, you know, I really enjoy that side of it. I always have. Um so I'd like to continue on that road, and um, and you never know what way that will take you, or who it'll, who you'll meet, or what you'll do. Um, and it's already been I've kind of dabbled in it in the past couple of months, and I've really enjoyed it so far. And it kind of pushes you as well as a writer when you know you're writing for someone else. It's not, you know, I'm not writing for the Cranberries now. It's for other people. Well, um, it's and the, it pushes you. Yeah. The the important thing is going to be for you to do what you love, mm. do it well. Uh, not have any or too many preconceived notions or expectations yeah. about things and sort of, uh, you know, you move forward in a direction that feels good for you. I always say this when I'm sort of uh, philosophizing that, you know, you kind of end up with these various destinations, you move toward them, but you keep all the options open on exactly. how you ultimately get yeah. there. And that's kind of my ending uh, for for every show. But, you know, I as like I've said many times, I live my life, run my business that way. And something I didn't learn until much later in life. But that seems to be the best way to do things. And it sounds like yeah. that's kind of the path that you're on as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. Well, look, this I, I must tell you, this has been one of the most enjoyable interviews I've done, learned a lot of things. Um, and of course I've had many of those along the way, but, Mm. um, you know, I'm just telling you that, that you're at the top of the list and, uh, 
So I, re- I really, I really want to you. thank you for taking the time, and I hope we can stay in touch. And you'll you'll keep me uh, uh, in the loop on on things that you're doing, and we'll do. Maybe we can yeah. we can catch up another time and and kind of compare notes yeah. and see what's happening. That'd be amazing. Yeah, and you know when you post this up on um, is it Wednesday? Is it gone up? This this yeah, it'll be up in a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, so if you could you send me the link because I can put it on our Facebook oh, page, yeah. the Cranberries. Oh and yeah, stuff you can and, count. Uh, you can count on that, my friend. <laughs> yeah, because we've got a few. Yeah. I think we're four point something million followers yeah, there. That, so look, yeah. I, I'm know. really excited. I think this is a. Uh, you know, we do a long form here. We try to get into yeah. things that are that uh, you know as uh, as I told you when we talked the other day. We try to not do too much of the low hanging fruit interview stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah. this has been really, really good. And I'm going to enjoy, Great. I'm going to enjoy uh, speaking with you. So once Great. again, thank you so much. For thank coming you. On. No, thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Jeff. So what did you think of our interview with Noel Hogan? We always want to hear from you and you can do that easily through the official episode page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business. You can email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com. And, well, you know the drill. If none of that's working for you, just call our GBR hotline at 888-777-2404. You can do that right now if you like or later. Operators are currently watching TV. If you call them right now, they might just get back to work. So what a great interview that was. I've always enjoyed the music of the Cranberries over the years, and getting the full behind-the-scenes backstory was really fascinating. And There was so much to learn there. I mean, I'm always looking for lessons in these interviews that I can follow up on and generalize in such a way that just about anyone can benefit from them. One such lesson was something that Noel described so eloquently that the band had to learn the hard way, so to speak, that... Uh, They really had to manage their working schedule in such a way that they could maintain their energy, creativity, and health. (laughs) Three very vital requirements for most of us, but especially in the fast-paced world that, you know, that they were living in and working in. They finally had to simply stop and take a lengthy break to decompress, refresh, regain their energy, creativity, health. Once they did that, returned to the business of touring and recording, well, they made some big changes that allowed them to take more frequent but shorter breaks in the action that allowed them to continue on in a much better way. Now, he said it took about six years or more to figure that out. And remember, he said in retrospect that if they had taken a break after their second album, it would have been much better for them. But who knows? We can't go back yet anyway. And even if we could, you know, it's complicated. (laughs) But at this point, we can't change the past, can't go back and do it differently. We can learn and grow from what we do and make adjustments that hopefully improve our outcomes both personally and professionally. You know, we may look back for a moment and say something like, um, if I only knew that sooner or, you know, something to that effect. Well, again, we can't go back, but going forward... We can do some things that allow us to see and know things sooner. But some people are in a hurry to know things sooner so they can do nothing with it faster. Do you know anyone like that? Has that been you on occasions? Well, by now, most of you know how I end the show. That has a lot to do with what I'm talking about here. We can so easily get distracted by our own narrow thinking, preconceived notions, malformed expectations that... We can't see most of what's really going on around us. And that's very limiting. We have to be able to regularly step away from our current thinking and open the windows wider to alternative possibilities. And, well, that doesn't happen automatically. It just doesn't. You have to be proactive about it. You have to think about it. And you have to take action. If you do that, I highly encourage you to stay positive. Stay focused on your destination, but don't be self-limiting. Keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week on Episode 71.
And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.